Combating cybercrime and protecting digital information topped the agenda at this year's workshop on the economics of information security. More than 100 academics, researchers, executives, and government officials gathered for three lively days of discussion and presentations at Dartmouth's Tuck School of Business. Well, the really neat thing about Weiss is that we bring an interdisciplinary group of people. So folks from law, from economics, from engineering, from computer science, from the public sector, from the private sector, all together uh, to discuss these really tough issues, identity theft, cybercrime, things that have faced citizens and regulators and businesses alike. Let's get it rolling. Let's get it rolling. Just look at the stats. You have to think about cybercrime in a different way. It's the fastest growing crime in America, in the world. The numbers have exploded. So from a media perspective, that makes it relevant because it affects you know, millions of people. I remember when I asked to be the computer security cybercrime reporter, or basically to, to take it on, there was nobody covering it. But look, this affects millions of people. There are really big companies involved. There are policy issues. There are social issues. And that's what matters to Business Week. How do you see the security story changing? How has it changed? I think, I think for us, the, the story has changed from being a noisy story to a much quieter story in, in say, the last five, six years. It's moved from the warm attacks, the, the, the mainstream media, CNN-type headline stories about a warm attack crippling a network or crippling CNN or crippling a, an airline, to a much quieter story where, you know, Malware authors and, and botnet operators and so on, they don't want that noise. Yeah. So much of it is a shadowy business be hidden behind nicknames, done over the computer, largely anonymous. And I've very often faced the challenge of not being able to sell an editor on a story because I can say theoretically this is what happened, but I can't point to a perp and I can't get him on the record to, uh, you know, to talk about what he did. When you do find those, uh, the perpetrators and you, and you get them on the record or even off the record conversations, as I think all of us have over the years, you largely find out that they're really uninteresting people for the most part. I mean, there's, they, they don't have some grand plan. You know, they were bored in a lot of cases and or they're doing it as a business. You know, if they could make that kind of money, you know, selling some other kind of widget, they would. But they just happen to have, you know, the ability and the, and the, the means to do it online. I mean, there, there's not a lot of really exciting, you know, uh, you know, KG, ex KGB types running around doing this stuff. I'm sure Byron has written ad nauseum the um, the line that says, "Hacking has changed from the pimply kid doing it for kicks to the organized crime group out for profit." <laughs> I've written it so many times, I don't want to write it again. <laughs> and that's how the macro story changed four years ago. Probably before that, you know, for the guys that are covering it every day. But today, I'd say there's a new wrinkle, which is actually reinvigorating the story. And that's that now the organized crime group, Hacking for Profit, has also begun to include the nation state sponsored um, hacking gang or People's Liberation Army, you know, information warfare unit. And it's become a national security story as well. It's only through public awareness that the public will put pressure on the bottom line of the corporations to, to make that change. Otherwise, they just do an accounting trick and, and assign it as an lo acceptable loss and divide it up and spread it out. So, and, then, and also, what they're, not, they're, they're assigning a very low premium to the ongoing threat of my Social Security number being out there with 300 million of, of, you, of you people out there in a stored database that the bad guys are just doing low-level stuff on now and can figure out what to do with on the future. Because it's not sexy. You can tell them that six trazillion cars were breached, and if they weren't breached, it's like, so what, you know? So there, there's a... Paris Hilton's one car. Yes, well, if it's Paris Hilton, that's always going to sell. Um, so, so there's some numbness. Um, I, I, I am still amazed at the apathy, you know, uh, even among executives. 
um, not just consumers, but executives, some of the CIO, CSO readers, who uh, there's a, a weird psychology going on. It's sort of, you know, it's, it's the same old story of, you know, the only people who buy ADT security systems are people who have had their houses robbed. So we're, we're making this big shift into this internet-enabled economy. So it's, and right now it's just, it's all about internet-enabled data theft and then what you do with that data. So I think this problem is going to continue to mushroom. Academic and corporate researchers exchanged their findings on a variety of timely topics. The, the focus of my research. So I come as a, as a, as a security guy. That's what I've, I've done for about a decade or so. It's my professional training. Uh, and then recently left industry to do this PhD work. So the work was in, P, in information security and now I'm looking at the economics of this. So it's, uh, uh, it's just sort of great research field. The paper was looking, it was a, a familiar public policy paper, looking at, at um, the effect of some treatment on an outcome. In our case, data breach disclosure laws on identity theft. So we're testing whether or not these laws have actually reduced identity theft. So Weiss has a proud tradition. Last year it was at Carnegie Mellon, the year before that at Cambridge in uh, England and the year before that at Harvard. And uh, it's uh, a conference is shared by an elite set of schools uh, to discuss these important issues.